Hello and welcome to the Russian Empire History Podcast, the history of all the peoples of the Russian Empire. I'm your host, J.P. Bristow. This is Season 1, The Forest, The Steppe and the Birth of the Russian Empire, and Episode 44, Sviatopolk II. My apologies for the unexpected break. There was supposed to be another interview episode a couple of weeks back, but the recordings were damaged, so I wasn't able to release it. As we left our story, Sivolod had ended his life as the sole ruler of Rus. But this did not mean that there were no succession problems this time. According to the tale of bygone years, when his father died, Vladimir Monomach reflected that if he took his father's throne in Kiev, he would become involved in hostilities with Sviatopolk, because his father had also sat on the throne of Kiev. So Vladimir summoned Sviatopolk from Turov, gave him Kiev, and went to Chernihiv, with his younger brother Rostislav getting Periaslavl. The tale does not provide us with any more detail than that, so we are left to guess whether this was due to Vladimir's personal commitment to the rules of collateral succession, or caution over getting involved in a fight. You might, for instance, note that Chernihiv had also been the city of someone else's father, while Vladimir's father had been in Periaslavl. Maybe the chronicler is just trying to cast Vladimir in a good light. Rostislav did not last long. Shortly after the death of Vsevolod, Rostislav died trying to escape from some Polovtsi. Meanwhile, in the south, Oleg Sviatovich was recruiting Polovtsian allies and by 1094 he was ready to move on Chernihiv. Vladimir defended the city for eight days before, as he later wrote, quote, I gave my cousin the throne of his father, and I myself went to the throne of my father at Periaslavl. We went between the ranks of the Polovtsi, about 100 of the Druzhina, with women and children, and the Polovtsi licked their lips at us like wolves. End quote. But this was only a temporary setback. The next year, Vladimir and Sviatopolk teamed up to drive Alec out of Chernihiv, accusing him of refusing to join the other rulers of Rus in fighting the Polovtsi. If he would not accept the responsibilities, he would not enjoy the rights either. Along with this move, there was the usual reshuffle in the other cities. David Sviatoslavovich was moved to Smolensk, and Vladimir's son Mstislav was moved from Rostov to Novgorod. However, Alex Sviatoslavovich was not just going to give up his claims. Feeling that the combined forces at Chernihiv were too much to bite off, he turned his attention to the outlying possessions in the northeast, opening up two years of constant warfare in which he killed one of Vladimir's sons at Suzdal. This conflict was what triggered the meeting at Lubech to settle what belonged to whom. The agreement at Lubech settled the division of lands among the three core families, much as it had been in the testament of Yaroslav, except for saying that each orchina, or patrimony, was now to be inherited within the branch that it belonged to. The crisis was resolved, and after some initial teasing troubles, The agreement would hold for the rest of Sviatopolk's reign in Kiev, where he ruled until 1113.
around the periphery, both in more important places like Novgorod or Tmutarakan, and smaller towns like Rostov and Suzdal or Morum, things did not go quite as smoothly towards this agreement as they did in the core. Several factors were in play besides the natural inclination of local rulers to detach themselves from faraway overlords and the ever-increasing number of princes without enough towns to go around. There was the economic orientation of the northeast towards the Baltic rather than down the Dnieper. The issues with the Vyatichians, which we've already mentioned, also still applied. They might nominally be vassals or tributaries, but it was generally recognized that it was not safe for the Rus to cross their territory, which happened to lie right between Kiev and the northeast. Instead, travelers would go the long way around, up the Dnieper and via Smolensk. The sons of Vladimir Monomach and Alek Sviatoslavich had fought fiercely over these outlying territories. First, Izyaslav, Monomach's son, who was based in Kursk, had taken Murom. Alek Sviatoslavich saw Murom as belonging to him, so he struck back by attacking Rostov and Suzdal. That brought another one of Vladimir's sons, Mstislav, now at Novgorod but previously Lord of Rostov, into the fight. As a result, the Lubech agreements included recognition that Murom belonged to the Sviatoslavici and Rostov and Suzdal to the Monomachs. The situation in the West was more complex. As you will recall, much of this territory had changed hands between the Rus and the Poles several times. Some towns had been held by branches of the clan that had dropped out of the running for the senior places, but still had descendants making claims on these outlying territories. You'll recall David Igorovich from the last episode. His rule in Vladimir in Volinia was also confirmed in Lubech. Smaller towns, Perimishil and Terubovil, went to Volodar and Vasilko Rostislavich, great-grandsons of Yaroslav through Vladimir, who had died before his father did, and therefore dropped out of the succession to the core cities. While the dispositions of Lubech brought peace in the core territories and the northeast, the conflict continued to escalate in the west, and always carried the risk of pulling the Poles, Hungarians and Polovtsi into the mix, especially as different families had different and rivalrous relationships with these neighboring kingdoms, and, as we've already seen, were ready to get them involved in conflicts within Rus itself. In 1097, only months after the agreement in Lubech, Agents acting for Sviatopolk Izyaslavich of Kiev and David Igorovich of Vladimir in Volinia seized Vasilko Rostislavich of Terebovo. Then they blinded him, a Byzantine-style mutilation that was not at all characteristic for Rus. The tale describes it in horrifying detail. Quote, During the night, they took Vasilko to Belgorod, a small town ten versts from Kiev. They transported him fettered in a cart, and after removing him from the vehicle, they led him into a small house. As he sat there, Vasilko saw a talk, sharpening a knife, and comprehending that they intended to blind him, he cried out to God with loud weeping and groaning. Then came the emissaries of Sviatopolk and David. Snovid, 
the son of Izietch, the squire of Sviatopolk, and Demeter, David's squire. And they laid a rug upon the floor, and after they had spread it, they seized Vasilko and endeavoured to overthrow him. He resisted violently, and they could not overthrow him. Then others came and cast him down. They bound him and laid a slab from the hearth upon his chest. Snavid sat on one side, and Dmitri on the other. But still they could not hold him down. Then two other men came. They took a second slab from the hearth and sat on him, weighing him so heavily that his chest cracked. Then a talk, Berendi by name, a shepherd of Sviatopolk, came up with his knife to strike him in the eye. But he missed the eye entirely and cut his face. This scar Vasilko bears to this day. Then he struck him in one eye and took out the pupil, and then in the other eye and removed its pupil. End quote. The bleeding and unconscious Vasilko is loaded back into the wagon and carried to Vladimir. David Igorovich claimed that Vasilko had been plotting against Sviatopolk and maybe was even involved in the murder of his brother ten years previously. Vasilko defended himself, claiming that what he actually wanted to do was recruit steppe peoples to attack Poland and Bulgaria. The tales give him a particular animus against the Poles, and he had, in fact, raided Poland on several occasions, including with the Polovtsi in 1092. The tale recognises the episode as unusual. When Vladimir is informed, he cries and declares, quote, Such a crime as this has never been perpetrated in Rus in the time of our grandfathers or our fathers. End quote. And then he summons David and Alek Sviatoslavich. They also weep and say such a thing has never happened before in our family. Some historians interpret these events as reflecting a difference over policy. At this point, it had been Kiev's policy for several decades to maintain good relations with the Poles, especially for Izyaslav and his family. So Vasilko could have been a threat to stable international relations. But on the other hand, even if there were sound political arguments for doing so, the rulers of Kiev and Vladimir in Volhynia moving against the ruler of a smaller city, especially with the unusual mutilation which must have caused quite a stir, was a clear breach of the Lubitsch Agreement and therefore threw the whole project into question. Monomach and the Sviatoslavici gathered their forces to march on Kiev, but they were persuaded to stand down by Sivolod's widow and appeals from the Metropolitan and the people of Kiev. Sviatopolk was also forced into some concessions. He had to withdraw from his alliance with David Igorovich. This actually escalated the problems in the West further by taking Kiev out of the equation and leaving more equally sized competitors to fight it out. Things are getting complicated here again. Besides David Igorovich and the Rostislavich brothers, Sviatopolk's sons Mstislav and Yaroslav, Yaropolk's sons Yaroslav and Vyacheslav, a guy called Svitosha, who was the son of David Sviatoslavich of Chernihiv, a Polish duke named Vladislav, who took money from Sviatopolk and David Igorovich, King Kalman of Hungary, and Boniak, a Polovsian leader, were all involved. By 1100, it was clear to the senior kings that they could not stay out of the spreading conflict, and so Sviatopolk Vladimir Monomak and David and Alek Sviatoslavich demanded that David Igorovich meet with them at Uvetici. The talks were about David Igorovich, not with him. According to the chronicler, the senior rulers talked from horseback, standing with their druzhinas, 
while David Igorovich sat off to the side and awaited their judgment. They decided that he would not have the throne of Vladimir in Volhynia any longer. Instead, it would be given to Sviatopolk's son, Yaroslav. In compensation, David Igorovich received some small towns in the west and 400 hryvnia to be paid by Vladimir Monomach and the Sviatoslavici. The result of Utevici was that all of the towns that had been mentioned in Yaroslav's testimony were back in the hands of the cousins from the three core families. The lands were effectively divided into spheres of influence. Chernikov and Periaslavl, on the left bank, controlled the east. Kiev controlled the west. These dispositions showed the senior cousins acting on their own authority to assign rule of cities, which reinforced their position again as the core powers making decisions for the periphery. The conference was successful. David Igorovich remained in Dorogobush until he died. Sviatopolk restored the friendship with Poland and married his his daughter, Zbyslava, to Boleslav III. Around the same time, Psyeslav of Polotsk finally ended his long life, which meant that his sons could also be brought back into the wider Rus family. The Lubitsch Agreement had begun by setting out the problems it intended to solve. Let's quote the tale's description in full. Sviatopolk and Vladimir and David Igorovich and Vasilko Rostislavich and David Sviatoslavich and his brother Alek gathered at Lubitsch for the settlement of a peace, and they spoke to one another, saying, why do we ruin the land of the Rus? Making strife among ourselves while the Polovtsi pillage our land and rejoice that there is war among us. Now and henceforth, let us be of one heart and let us protect the land of the Rus. Let each keep his own patrimony. Let Sviatopolk have Kiev, the patrimony of Izyaslav. Let Vladimir have the patrimony of Vsyevolod and to let David and Oleg and Yaroslav have the patrimony of Sviatoslav. And for those to whom towns were allocated by Tsevolod, David shall have Vladimir in Valinia, and for the two Rostislavici, Volodar shall have Perimishl, and Vasucho shall have Teribovl. And on this they kiss the cross. And if any henceforth shall turn against each other, then we all and the Holy Cross shall turn against him. And they said, May the Holy Cross and the land of the Rus be against him. End quote. As we've already heard in this episode, it took them a fair bit of turning against each other to get to this agreement, and there would still be some turning against each other after it. But within a few years and with a few adjustments, they had a functioning agreement and were all on the same side. They had settled the question of war among themselves. Now, with this full alliance between all the leading Rus, there was a shift from a defensive stance to attack. It was time to deal with the steppe. The Rus had indeed been losing to the Polovtsi. In 1093, Sviatopolk, Vladimir Monomach, and his brother Rostislav had combined to fight them. The Rus army was routed and Rostislav drowned in the Stugna while trying to escape. The Polovtsi had defeated Sviatopolk later again in the same year. They destroyed Torchesk, a settlement of Orhus Turk, allied with the Rus. The next year, Alek Sviatoslavich 
had brought Palovsians to help push Vladimir Monomach out of Chernihiv. The Rus had tried diplomacy. Sviatopolk married the daughter of a Palovsi Khan named Turahan. Then, in February 1096, Vladimir Monomach opened negotiations himself, but this was just a ruse, and when he received two Polovtsian leaders, Hitler and Kitan, he killed them. Alex Sviatoslav gave Hitler's son shelter and continued the friendly relations with the Polovtsi that he had begun in Tmutorakan. This was a major problem for Sviatopolk and Vladimir Monomach, who could not push the Polovtsi out of the central Znipa region if Chernikiv was not along for the ride. This was the major factor in them turning against Aliyag and allying to drive him out. But attacking Chernikiv left Kiev and Periaslav vulnerable, and Tugokan and Bonyak took the opportunity to do some raiding. Bonyak reached as far as Kiev and burned Sviatopolk's house at Beristova before pillaging the monastery of the caves and other churches. But Aleg and his steppe allies had ended up with nothing for their efforts, so he was also forced to settle for the agreement at Lubech and rejoin the rest of Rus. The tale describes Sviatopolk and Vladimir meeting with their Druzhinas. Sviatopolk's Druzhina are concerned that if they go to war in the spring, the peasants will miss their planting season. Vladimir counters them, quote, Why do you not consider this? If a peasant starts to plough, a Polovtsian may come and shoot him and take his horse and ride into the village to take his wife and his children and all that he has. End quote. Sviatopolk's Druzhina couldn't find an answer, but Sviatopolk spoke up and said, Now I am ready. So Sviatopolk and Vladimir had decided that action would be better than inaction, and they summoned the rest of the clan. Alex Sviatoslavich claimed he was sick and didn't come, but his brother David did. David Sviatoslavich, Mr. Slav, we seem to be getting an awful lot of Mr. Slavs, this one is the grandson of Igor, Vyacheslav Yaropolkovich and Yaropolk Vladimirovich also join in. Like previous campaigns the tale describes, some went by boat and some went by horseback, aiming for a deep strike into the steppe that would significantly weaken the Polovt scene. While this campaign did not manage that, it was a successful start for the Rus. A few Polovtsian princes were killed, and the plunder was enough to make the effort worthwhile. Further expeditions took place over the next few years, some led by Sviatopolk and Vladimir, others by their sons and other cousins. They pushed as far as the Donets and the Don, not far enough to conquer the Polovtsians, which was probably never the aim, but doing more than enough to re-establish a secure southern border. The biggest campaign was in 1111. With all the main rulers and their sons, they defeated large forces of Polovtsi and returned in glory, which, the chronicler says, was reported to the Greeks and the Hungarians and the Poles and the Czechs, and even to Rome. The tale presents the campaign expressly as a war of Christians against pagans. This may have been the first case of a sedentary European society taking on the mantle of Europe's shield against the Asian hordes. Before too long, Hungary would be presenting itself in the same way against the Mongols, and the trope, adopted at one time or another by every country in Eastern Europe, has endured down to the rhetoric around the war in Ukraine today.
further diplomatic efforts were also made. Two of Vladimir Monomarch's sons and one of Alex Sviatoslavich's were married to Pavlovian princesses. This was part of an overall trend. The number of marriages into European royalty was falling. Marriages into the steppe increased, especially as second marriages. The first would be to a Christian bride, the second to a Polovtsian after the death of the first. Sivolod Yaroslavich, Sviatopolk and Vladimir Monomach all followed this pattern. Daughters, on the other hand, were not married to non-believing step rulers. For some, it became difficult to find a European spouse. The Izyaslavici had married several times into the Polish royal family, to the extent that their respective members were now too closely related to be able to intermarry any more. Papal dispensation had already been needed for the marriage of Boleslav III and Spuslava. At the same time, marriages were necessary to maintain their alliance. This led to marriages to leading Polish nobility as a substitute. The Monomachs were excluded from the relationship with Poland, which meant that they had to look elsewhere. Mstislav in Novgorod renewed the old relationship with Scandinavia, somewhat neglected in the last few decades, by marrying Christina Inga's daughter of Sweden. Two of their children would also marry Scandinavian royalty. At the same time, for their clan as a whole, its expansion meant weakening consanguinity and therefore it became possible for Rus nobility to marry other Rus nobility. So the decline of Rus as a united kingdom, as the kings and princes became more closely connected to their own domains, was also accompanied by a weakening of its international ties. Meanwhile, some of the families in the peripheral cities of the West developed their own international marriage ties, which laid more of the groundwork for Rus to drift apart. The Lubitsch Agreement also established conferences of the kings and princes of Rus as a means of resolving their problems. They met in 1097, 1100, 1101, 1103, and 1111. Sviatopolk's name was always in first place, but none of the conferences was held in Kiev or the capital of any of the other kings. Instead, they gathered somewhere in the country on neutral ground. There was no ceremony involved, and they were collegial discussions rather than Sviatopolk handing down decisions, but they were treated as formal occasions with the authority to make decisions and were recorded by the chroniclers. This was also the time when the monks in Kiev began to compile the tale of bygone years and to keep records of contemporary events. In other words, As the ruling clan and the lands they ruled expanded, which led to families within the clan becoming more distinct entities with their own interests, they worked together to adapt their customs and create a political culture that enabled them to deal with the challenges that they faced. Especially attempting to maintain Kiev's overall place at the head of the pyramid, while defending their own personal shares and their ochinas against the reallocation of cities and towns. We've heard several cases of the tale moralising at length about one king or another who went to war with a brother or usurped a throne, but we can also see that the system was not excessively rigid. Instead it was rather pragmatic and the clan was willing to stretch or overlook rules to maintain stability or alliances when necessary. Franklin and Shepard argue that Sviatopolk Izyaslavovich is one of the overlooked rulers of Rus. 
is overlooked mainly because, as you will find out in the next couple of episodes, after his death, Vladimir Monomakh is going to become a myth-making national legend and future saint. He will understand the power of self-promotion, happily take credit for the achievements of others, and make sure that his chroniclers push any rivals into the shadows and rewrite whatever necessary to present him in a better light. Despite this, the pathway that Rus will follow for the rest of its history takes shape during Yaropolk's twenty years as the head of the clan. Twenty years in which he does not try to restore sole rule, but instead prefers collective action and unity with his cousin kings, communal defences and mutual obligations, ideas which the tale shows us forming in the testament of Yaroslav and in the agreement at Lubech. The obvious weak point to this was that it was a response to conditions, to the threat of the Polovtsi in the steppe, the need to do something about the growing clan and expanding territory of the Rus. Therefore, if the conditions changed, people's interests could also change. It also created its own conditions in which each ruler's interests and focus became tied more and more closely to their own personal patrimony. What would happen if the peripheral princes no longer recognized common interests and obligations with the kings of Kiev and Chernihiv? Skatopolk's rule in Kiev also coincided with the beginning of the Crusades. You'll recall Christian Raffensperger speaking about Euphraxia, the wife of Holy Roman Emperor Henry IV, going to speak to the Pope at the Council of Piacenza in 1095, where a messenger from Alexius Komnenos came to ask for Western aid against the Turks, leading to Pope Urban II preaching the First Crusade. She may well have reported some of this back to Kiev. A century earlier, the Rus had been providing Constantinople with the bulk of the Varangian Guard, so you might wonder why there was no appeal to the Rus for assistance. It seems that relations with Byzantium might not have been at their high point during this period. Early on in Sviatopolk's reign, David Sviatoslavich had attacked and robbed Byzantine merchants, which was a clear breach of the treaties between Rus and Byzantium. But the kings of Rus had not taken action against him. Later, Tmutarakan drops out of the tale as a result of the wars between Alex Sviatoslavich and his cousins. The most likely reason is that it was taken by Byzantium, which had continued to maintain a presence on the northern shore of the Black Sea. And there continues to be an implied standoff over Byzantine influence in the church. The tale does not go too far into it, but there are hints that the Rus were quite happy when the death of a metropolitan left them without a Greek in charge for a few years. Rus also quickly adopted the new Feast of St. Nicholas, which was instituted by the Pope as an insult to the Patriarch of Constantinople after some relics were stolen from the east and carried to Italy. There is one record of a person from Rus travelling to the Holy Land, an abbot named Daniel who goes on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem in 1105. The abbot met with King Baldwin of Jerusalem and celebrated Easter in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, where he was invited to light a candle on behalf of the Russian church. This again shows that the Russian church did not seem to be caught up in the feud between Rome and Constantinople until later. And that is the only record we have of a Rus connection to the Crusades, so we have to conclude that Byzantium did not feel like it could ask them for help, and the Rus did not feel like volunteering. Sviatopolk died on the 16th of April, 1113. 
According to the tale, the people of Kiev quickly sent word to Vladimir Monomach, asking him to take the throne of his father and grandfather, and after a little thought, he came. His reign and the reign of his son, Mstislav, who will earn the title of the Great, are the final flowering of ancient Rus, before, as the tale laments, it is torn apart. We are reaching the final phase of the story of Rus, but that is for next year. I wish you all a happy holiday season. There will be a new member episode around the middle of January, and then our story will continue sometime around the end of the month. If you are stuck for something to listen to, there are already 10 member episodes available through Patreon, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or a PayPal subscription on the website. And you can also purchase them individually on Patreon. Thank you once again to all the patrons and subscribers who have supported the podcast this year. Next year will be a big one. Rus will break up. On the Volga, the Bulgarians expand their kingdom. We'll be looking at the Balts and the Baltic Crusades. And the Mongols are coming. Thank you for listening. And until next time, goodbye. <laughs>